What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back out again with another video. So we're gonna check out Unresolved, Cancelled, and Abandoned Wrestling Storylines. We've seen it before where they would, you know, build up a story. You know, they're trying to tell a story and they, you know, they got some important people behind it. And then something happens and then we just forget about it. If y'all remember when Shayna came back and I think he was feuding with The Undertaker and... It was supposed to be some type of stipulation. I forgot what it was where essentially it involved a box or something like that. If y'all remember, I think if if The Undertaker won or something like that, or if Shane won, he would get the box. It was supposed to be something that would expose the McMahons. I don't know if y'all remember. It was It was weird, but they never followed up on it after the match. Like, I don't remember the logistics of what happened if whoever won. Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's just, it involved the box or some type of information that was supposed to be leaked if whoever won. It was never leaked. We never got a follow-up, so who fucking knows? But definitely that would fall into that category. So we're going to check this out. Should be a good one. Let's get right into this one, man. Shout out to Wrestling Bios. Subscribe to him if you haven't already. Storylines and angles taking place throughout the history of pro wrestling, there's always going to be those that don't work out. Sometimes an injury leads to a story coming to a halt. Sometimes uh -huh. the creative team want to go in a different direction while the storyline's already underway. And sometimes it feels like the writers legitimately forgot what happened a week prior and they move on in hopes that no one was paying attention. Mm -hmm. Whatever the case, let's look at pro wrestling storylines that either ended abruptly, didn't have a conclusion, or featured moments that got scrapped and hopes that fans would forget. GTV. The first one is an obvious one, GTV. GTV segments aired on Raw during the Attitude Era and they featured pro wrestlers and other personalities getting filmed without their prior consent. The footage that aired would sometimes further storylines, such as Test and Stephanie McMahon's relationship. The footage would sometimes help with cross-promotion, such as the cast of Mystery Men getting filmed without their knowledge. And sometimes the footage was just used to embarrass people. GTV was dropped out of nowhere and the person behind GTV was never revealed. It's widely believed that Goldust was going to be revealed as the man behind these hidden camera recordings, but Dustin Reynolds this. left WWF before the reveal could happen. A dead giveaway here is the fact that the first ever GTV segment was actually named GDTV, but this was changed oh. because it was a bit too obvious. When yeah. Dustin got released, the WWF toyed with the idea of using Tom Green, but Vince McMahon didn't like him. Glenn Ruth, better known as Headbanger Thrasher, was also brought up as a possible name behind GTV, but we never did find out who the culprit was, and the segments just ended with no payoff. Yeah, I definitely don't remember that, actually. <laughs> Booker's note. In November 2003, Booker T was in the locker room getting ready for an upcoming match. Someone sent Booker an envelope that Heidenreich handed over to the five-time WCW still remember. champion. Booker <laughs> opened up the envelope, a note was inside that said, I still remember. In the WWE were hoping that you wouldn't remember this little backstage segment because it was totally forgotten about the following week. People have speculated that it was supposed to be from Goldust. I read a few comments where some folks thought it was going to be Stevie Ray, but I highly doubt it. Nonetheless, this mystery remains unsolved, and Booker <laughs> just carried on with his business, even though he seemed a little shook after receiving I the I still animal. remember, but I'm going to keep doing what I was doing. The WCW Wide Hummer. <laughs> I'm going to talk about this a little more in a future video, but in short, we never found out exactly who it was driving the Hummer that hit Kevin Nash. At first, it seemed like a done deal. Nash was feuding with Randy Savage, and the first Hummer incident took place just before Great American Bash 99. Big Kev thought it could have been Sting, seeing as Sting was seen in a Hummer during a backstage brawl with Rick Steiner, a black Hummer may I add. But at the Great American Bash 99, Sid Vicious made his return to WCW to help Randy Savage, and even the commentary team put two and two together here to conclude that Sid was the man behind the wheel. 
Things got convoluted though when Sid and Savage used a fake sting to keep Nash and fans guessing following the match at Great American Bash, and when it seemed like the angle had ended, Lex Luger tried to convince Sting that it was actually Hulk Hogan driving what? the car. Sting begins to believe Luger when he finds Macho Man and Gorgeous George in Hogan's locker room, but bizarrely, it's Sting who turns heel when this part of the storyline wraps up and the Hummer stuff gets totally forgotten about. Then, during the Russo era, the Hummer was brought back when Hogan stopped Bischoff from running him over, and get this, Hogan then drives the Hummer into a dumpster containing one Billy Kidman. This might make some conclude that Bischoff was behind the previous attacks, but you have to remember that Eric Bischoff was a babyface when the original Hummer attack happened back in 99, and he also had his own issues with Randy Savage. I think the whole Hummer thing was supposed to start and end with Sid Vicious, but they kept it going way longer than it should have because they didn't know how to end it. Just typical WCW real. Yeah, that definitely was so convoluted. <laughs> like super convoluted, like what? <laughs> Speaking of Lex Luger, there was one brief moment on Nitro where fans could see Lex and Miss Elizabeth standing at a podium. Lex was wearing a suit and he was just about to give a speech, but then the cameras got cut off and we didn't hear a single word from the total package. This was also completely forgotten about and I'm sure many of you also forgot that this happened. This was also months before the reborn Lex Luger stuff. Lex even showed up afterwards to help out his buddy Sting as if nothing had happened. So the whole purpose of this little moment at the podium still remains a complete mystery. Oh. We know why this was cancelled. But for those who don't know, we'll let him explain it. A heavy hitter for sure, and one you can absolutely understand why it got cancelled. Yeah. It's the death of Mr. McMahon. A clearly distraught Vince McMahon got into his limousine at the end of a special episode of Raw dubbed Mr. McMahon Appreciation Night. You see, Vince took a beating from Bobby Lashley at One Night Stand 2007, and this loss was enough to break Vince and make him act very strangely. Seeming almost hypnotized and a little lost, McMahon approached his limousine at the very end of Raw, he got inside and then boom, the vehicle goes up in flames. The WWE were preparing to run a long Who Killed Vince McMahon storyline with multiple suspects, but then the Benoit tragedy happened and the WWE felt it would be in bad taste to continue the storyline. Yeah. This whole thing has been covered quite a lot on YouTube though and I even put together a video on the whole storyline. Check that one out if you want to learn more. When you really think about it, this he really thought that was just a good idea to fake his death in a car explosion and then we were gonna fit, sit here and figure out who killed vince and then at some point he was gonna probably come back so i don't know it's, it was just it was it was a wild one Here's another one involving the McMahon family, Shane McMahon's lockbox. Shane returned to WWE on the February 22nd, 2016 I said this. episode of I said WWE. This. I'm glad he brought this up. This is what I said at the beginning, so I was hoping he would have this in his Here's video. Here's another one involving the McMahon family, Shane McMahon's lockbox. Shane returned to WWE on the February 22nd, 2016 episode of Raw, just when his sister Stephanie was about to receive the Vincent J. McMahon Legacy of Excellence Award. Yeah, I know, very prestigious. And yeah. Shane came back for one thing, he wanted to take control of Monday Night Raw. This leads to Vince booking Shane in a match against The Undertaker. Uh -huh. If Shane wins, then he'll get his wish and he'll take over the WWE's flagship Monday Night Wrestling show. If he loses, then Shane has to hand over a lockbox that contains what we assume some dark secret about Vince McMahon that his son's been using for leverage. With yeah. everything that's happening okay. with McMahon recently, I'm sure many of you have the same thoughts. <laughs> as well. Yeah, maybe he really did have that lockbox. I do when watching this back. I mean, dark secrets, like, come on. But in the end, we never found out exactly what it was in Shane's lockbox because The Undertaker defeated Shano at WrestleMania yeah. and the contents of said lockbox were completely forgotten about. Yep. It was speculated that the whole idea of the lockbox was never meant to be part of the storyline. Vince McMahon apparently ad libbed the whole thing because he forgot his lines mid promo. But really, when you think about it, Shane <laughs> did lose the match and therefore whatever was in that box was kept under lock and key as it should. The storyline really played out as promised. 
That being said, this is pro wrestling. In these kind of mysteries that cause wide speculation <laughs> usually get solved no matter what. Quick side note, and this is just my take. Vince saying lockbox could have been a figure of speech and he didn't actually mean she inhaled a physical lockbox with something sinister hidden inside, but it is way more fun to think about Shane having this one item that could ruin Vince forever. Turned, it turned out though Shane didn't have to do anything. Yep, he didn't have to do a damn thing. And it, that does sound like Vince would have forgot his line, so he just said some random shit. I, that sounds just like Vince would do. Battle of the Bellas. Nikki and Brie Bella were involved in a rivalry that began when Nikki Bella betrayed her sister to help mm -hmm. out Stephanie McMahon. I remember Sibling this. Sibling rivalries in pro wrestling are absolutely nothing new, and most of the time they are effective due to the personal bond the participants share with each other. And these two did get pretty personal, with Nikki bullying her sister and saying some pretty horrible things to her. But the storyline began to rapidly lose fan interest when Jerry Lawler tried to bring peace to the Bella Twins, and Jerry Springer also tried to find some common ground between the sisters along with Bella brother JJ. Nikki would yeah. beat her sister at Hell in a Cell 2014, meaning Brie would become Nikki's servant. Mm -hmm. Most fans began switching the channel when Nikki made her sister do some downright mean things such as make her smoothies and serve her tea. And then Brie just randomly decided that her sister was right all yeah. along and the Bellas reunited like nothing had happened. Brie assisted Nikki in beating AJ Lee at Survivor Series that year. The Bella Twins were back together, and the weird moral- That shit was stupid, bro. When you really think about it, there, there was- She just sided with her. I was like, wait, huh? Y'all been- She been mistreat- <sighs> Okay. It was dumb. Of the story is, you should bully your siblings into thinking your way, and eventually they'll break and realize they were wrong. The promos featuring the Feud and Bella twins were not good. Fan interest was really low, except for those who really liked Nikki and Brie. And in the end, being really mean to Brie gave Nikki Bella the longest Divas Championship reign in history, while her sisters stood at her side. For oh. well, what? Don't know. Hideo Itami, better known as Kenta, was scheduled to face Tyler Breeze and Finn Balor in a match to determine the number one contender for the NXT Championship. The match was booked for NXT TakeOver Unstoppable on May 20th, 2015, but before the bout could take place, Itami suffered a legitimate shoulder injury that was going to keep him off TV for around six months. To explain Itami's absence, he was attacked in the full sale parking lot before Unstoppable went on the air. I'm telling you, man, that parking lot is dangerous. And fans never did get to see who the attacker was. The Revival were on the scene checking on Hideo, Kevin Owens walked past while saying this is all a terrible shame, and in the end, Tyler Breeze and Finn Balor had a one-on-one -on -one match that Balor won. People have went for the obvious choice and mm -hmm. said it was Kevin Owens, others speculated it was Finn Balor or Tyler Breeze, some even thought it could have been Samoa Joe who made his NXT debut later that evening, but I think this one never got resolved because Hideo Itami ended up on the bench much longer than originally uh -huh. thought and the whole thing just got scrapped. Hideo Itami was really unlucky though when it came to injuries during mm -hmm. his NXT tenure, and this one in particular leaves us with another angle that never got resolved. Kane versus yeah I remember this I remember Kane this versus Kane my god the masked version of Kane came back to haunt the real Kane which may I add isn't a terrible idea when you think about it I mean the Kane character definitely leans into the more paranormal side of pro wrestling with his ability to set fire to people just by raising his <laughs> arms his ability to shoot fireballs from his hands all that stuff the idea of Kane's past coming back as a real living, breathing entity could have worked, but you really need to take extra care when doing something that's so out there and so out of the box. Mm -hmm. It's either going to be really good or it's going to be absolutely terrible. And unfortunately, the execution of this particular storyline was absolutely terrible. <laughs> Luke Gallows played the role of the imposter Kane, and look at the state of this Kane attire during the character's debut. I mean, it's one of the easiest things to get right, and thankfully, they did get it right eventually, but right here it looks like a bad Halloween outfit that you'd find on Amazon. You know, first impressions are important. <laughs> this whole idea was thrown in the bin after only a few weeks. The imposter Kane defeated the real Kane at Vengeance, but then the next night the imposter got his mask removed by the real Kane while getting thrown out of the arena. And then nothing. It was never was it. mentioned again. 
There were reports floating around about the original direction this storyline was supposed to take, and it's fascinating for sure. Apparently, Glenn Jacobs was considering retirement, and the WWE wanted mm. to keep the Kane character alive on their TV shows. Glenn was also going to be off TV either way, seeing as he was uh. about to promote his movie See No Evil around Europe. So, reportedly, the idea was that the imposter Kane was actually going to get revealed as the real Kane, while Glenn Jacobs was actually the fake. The story goes that Glenn <laughs> kidnapped the real Kane and he assumed his identity, and the real Kane would come back, beat Glenn at vengeance, and take over over is the rightful and real big red machine of WWE. <laughs> but it's so convoluted, bro. So Glenn Jacobs was not the real Kane, man. and when he uh, took his mask off, it was an imposter, then the real Kane said, Kane said, hey, hold on, wait a minute, he's not the real Kane, I'm the real Kane. So he would come back, attack the real Kane, Glenn Jacobs would then go film his movie, and then he would come back from there, and then be the real Kane, but in the mask. Okay, all right. that's, that, that, that's the gist of it, okay. Now, whether this is true is also up for debate, and there's also a good chance that fans would have hated the Kane they knew getting replaced by someone else, but it is still pretty interesting to think about. That being said, the WWE completely shit the bed with this one right out the gate. Imposter Kane looked horrible, fans didn't react <laughs> at all, and the company decided to completely scrap the idea because it got so much negative feedback. That's funny, bro. Who attacked Edge? Similar to Hideo Itami during his days in NXT, WWE superstar Edge was attacked backstage at No Way Out 2003, and just like Hideo, this was due to a legitimate injury mm -hmm. that was going to keep the future rated R superstar off TV for an extended period of time. Edge was set to compete in a six-man tag, teaming up with Brock Lesnar and Chris Benoit to take on Team Angle, but Edge got attacked and it was never revealed who was behind the assault. Obviously, you're going to point the finger at Kurt Angle, Shelton Benjamin and Charlie yeah. Haas, but the WWE never actually said that Team Angle were behind the attack and when Edge returned to TV, it was never brought up yeah. again. They just said, oh, he got attacked by a ghost. Here's another one from World Championship Wrestling. Before the Owen Hart tragedy at WWF Over the Edge 99, Kevin Nash went on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno to challenge Bret Hart to a special match. Both Bret and Nash were to put up a quarter million each in prize money, and the match itself was scheduled to take place not on Nitro, not on pay-per-view, not even on Thunder. No, the match was actually going to take place on The Jay Leno Show. This isn't as random as you might think. The competitors putting up a quarter million was introduced because a month or two prior, Bill Goldberg challenged Steve Austin to a fight, and Bill said he'd put up $250,000 if Steve could beat him. This challenge was also let out on Jay Leno's show, mm. and when Kev challenged Brett, he did make reference to Austin declining to fight Goldberg. Owen passed away before the match could take place, and Brett took time away from TV to mourn yeah. the loss of his brother. Nash vs. Brett on The Tonight Show didn't happen, so WCW had to change direction. Understandably so. Raven and the Deadpool. The Deadpool in WCW consisted of Raven, Vampiro, Violent J, and Shaggy 2 Dope. While you may look back at this group and think it's a pretty odd formation featuring a bunch of guys with very little in common, they got some pretty good crowd reactions, which even surprised me when going back to watch their stuff for Raven the War. Raven stayed silent while the Deadpool were in WCW. The ICP and Vampiro could be quite boisterous, and they didn't mind celebrating their victories or cutting promos on their upcoming opponents. But Raven's role in the group was kind of mysterious, he just showed up during a beatdown one week and his motivations were never made clear. The story of the Deadpool was killed off when an infamous backstage talent meeting in WCW led to Raven walking out of the company and never coming back. Bischoff was ripping into his roster backstage and Raven decided to take up Eric's offer when the boss said he could walk out the door if he wasn't happy. With Raven gone, the Deadpool eventually became the Dark Carnival, and while the Dark Carnival was very similar to the Deadpool, it didn't have the same element of mystery mm. when Raven left. That being said, I'm fairly confident that WCW didn't have any kind of long-term plan for the stable anyway. Raven could have definitely had something in store and he could have pitched ideas, but at the same time, he was really checked out of WCW seeing as the company had no intentions of pushing him further up the cards, and when he had the chance to walk out, well, he took it. Yeah. Anybody want to leave? That would be me. 
WWF NWO. The WWF version of the NWO, I thought, started off pretty well. The company decided to keep things simple with the original Phantom Fathers coming in to cause uh -huh. chaos on WWF's top baby faces. But things went in a different direction when Hulk yep. Hogan was turned babyface and Scott Hall continued to struggle with his personal demons. Mm -hmm. The group was rebuilt with new members. Shawn Michaels returned as the NWO spokesman, and the faction began a storyline where they'd try to enlist Triple H. Hunter's personal relationship with Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash and X-Pac were at the forefront of this storyline, and fans were left wondering if Triple H would begin wearing the famous black and white t-shirts, or mm -hmm. if he'd begin a rivalry against his old best friends. During a six-man main event match on Raw, Kevin yeah. Nash suffered an injury the moment he stepped into the uh -huh. ring, and after Big Sexy tore his quads in this six-man tag match, the decision was made to completely kill the NWO once and for all as an active faction within the world of pro wrestling. Vince McMahon came out the following week while the NWO's entrance music played in the arena. McMahon then announced that this was the last time fans would ever hear the famous theme music because the NWO were now gone forever, so the whole Triple H NWO angle was dropped and instead a rivalry began between yep. the game and Shawn Michaels. At the time I, I was wish the rivalry was so fucking good, but it made sense. Once Nash got hurt, yeah, it was that was that was it. They they kinda had to to kinda go in a different direction annoyed that the nwo didn't work out in wwe but looking back now i can see it was probably for the best mm -hmm. it's one of those things that was probably never meant to be but it was still pretty cool seeing nash hall and hogan show up to wwf television while representing the groundbreaking faction mm -hmm. definitely a legendary baby doll blackmail NWA fans were captivated with a very brief storyline featuring Dusty Rhodes, Larry Sabisco, and Baby Doll. Larry wanted Dusty's US title, and if the American Dream didn't give Zabisco a match, then Dusty was going to have some serious problems. Mm. You see, Baby Doll had some dirt on Dusty, a secret that could potentially destroy the American Dream if it ever went public. And this secret would get revealed to the world if Dusty didn't comply with Zabisco's demands. So serious was this secret that it could apparently land Dusty in jail, so it must have been something pretty heavy. During an interview, Baby Doll approached Dusty and she handed him an envelope. Dusty looked inside, he got a little worried, and after Baby Hey, Dusty had that trip. You see this jacket? Dusty had that trip, man. Dusty had that trip. Baby Doll said Dusty wasn't as righteous as everyone thinks he is. She gave him a peck on the cheek before walking off. Weeks later, Baby Doll got released and the contents of the envelope were never revealed. Larry Sabisco said Baby Doll was supposed to give Dusty a passionate kiss, not a peck on the cheek, and because she didn't comply, she got fired. However, mm. I don't believe this, seeing as she was still on TV for two months after the kiss happened. Baby Doll said she was fired from Jim Crockett Promotions because her husband, Sam Houston, was hired by WWF and the folks running JCP thought it was a conflict of interest. Uh. Baby Doll said on the WSI YouTube channel that she still has the envelope and she knows what's inside. She teased a few theories and a few ideas of what was inside that elusive envelope. It could be a sneak peek of the portfolio Baby Doll built around Dusty's bad deeds during the time she served as his valet. It could be images of Dusty going to a hotel room to visit an unknown woman. The only person who knows is Baby Doll, and whether you believe her or not is completely up to you. That's crazy. That is crazy, man. What if she really had some real dirt? Because back then, they were doing... It was different. It, wrestling was much different back then. They were... They were on that timing of actually doing like, like they would blur the lines of what's real and what's a work. So don't know if it was something really in there. Who knows? But it was a different time back then where boys was, you know, they were doing whatever they could to portray what's happening on screen. What you seeing is real. So. This one did kind of have an ending, but it was such a poor payoff that the only logical conclusion we have is that plans were changed. Desperate for a ratings bump in 2008, mm -hmm. Vince McMahon promised this. to give away $1 million live on Raw. The chairman was handing out his own money apparently, and the action in the ring came to a screeching halt while Vince rang a few phone numbers to give away his money. I suppose there's worse things you could spend your cash on though, right Vince? Anyway, these parts of Raw were sometimes comically bad. A lot of times, folks just wouldn't answer their phones, and Vince even got Rick rolled during one particular phone call. <laughs> this series of free money giveaways, however, known as Mr. McMahon's Million Dollar Mania, ended yep. when the customized set yep. fell on top of Vince in the lock 
locker room went into a state of panic. Instead of being serious, it turned out absolutely hilarious when he was famously <laughs> shouting, Paul, I can't feel my legs. Paul, of course, being Triple H. And it all obviously looked like we were going to end up with another who done it angle, similar yeah, to what was supposed to happen when McMahon's limousine blew up. In the end, though, fans didn't find out who brought the million dollar mania set crashing down on Vince. Shane and Stephanie were unhappy with the lack of unity after the accident and the unruly nature the WWE had went in since Vince disappeared. And so it all ended with Mike Adamley being named the new Raw GM in an uh. effort to restore harmony to WWE Raw. For a storyline featuring the attempted murder of Vince McMahon, the payoff was incredibly weak. You therefore come to the conclusion that more was supposed to come of all this, but in the end, well, nothing really happened. Nope. Fans didn't find out why the set fell down or who was responsible. It was kind of brushed off as nothing more than a freak accident. Mike Adamley was not well received as the Raw GM. And when you consider that Vince McMahon spent more money on Million Dollar Mania than what he did when purchasing WCW, then you can see why this was a catastrophic flop that did yeah. nothing to increase WWE's viewership. Again, this is something I'm going to cover a bit more in the future, so look out for that video very soon. <laughs> I remember that. Shit just came falling down. It just, like, stuff was just randomly happening. Like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> What's happening here? Why? Why? What in the final destination is going on in WWE? I got <laughs> off quite a few other storylines that were either abandoned, abruptly stopped, or swept under the rug, and I'm going to cover these in a follow-up video very soon. As always, you're very welcome to put your suggestions in the comment section, and I'll look over these when I'm going to put together part two. It's important, though, to remember that essentially shit happens. If everything was perfect yeah. in the world of wrestling and storylines, then things would also get pretty boring after a while. Plans changing, ideas getting reworked, new ideas replacing old ones. All these things make the creative side of wrestling a bit more interesting, and it also gives us things to ponder over and things to talk about. I do hope you enjoyed this video, though, and thank you very, very much for watching. Please take care. This was a dope one, man. I'm going to go ahead and like this because he be putting a lot of time and effort into these vids. So he definitely deserves some likes on here. Boom. I'm going to go ahead and like this. Like I said, go subscribe to Wrestling Bios if you haven't already. This was a dope one. Some of these stories I did not know <laughs> didn't get finished in some of them. I remember. So comment down below. Let me know. Can y'all remember a wrestling storyline that started off good or had some type of intrigue and then went nowhere? like just if it wasn't listening in this video because i'm sure there's a lot more they started something and, and it, it just they didn't finish it so let me know down below but i appreciate all love support rose 50k appreciate y'all kicking with me see y'all next one peace